Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, welcome to Timber Development UK's Southside Hereford University Design Challenge. Um, this is a student design competition and it's in partnership with Passive House Trust, Edinburgh Napier University and NLIGHT. Um, my name is Yogini and I'm from the Passive House Trust. And today um, we're just uh, going to be looking at this competition in a bit more detail. Um, so thanks all, uh, also to all the sponsors listed below here on the screen. Um, the competition is a detached community centre on a greenfield site. Um, once you register for the competition, you'll get more details on the brief. Um, and it's predominantly being built out of timber and to meet passive house standards. Um, so again, more details on the brief will be coming soon. And today is one of several webinars. Um, you can see these are all free to attend to all participants of the student competition. Everything will be recorded. So if you miss anything and you can't make Tuesday or Thursday evening, um, please do get on the YouTube channel and you can view all of the sessions um, again, freely available. And congratulations to everyone here because you are taking the next step in your climate literacy and are actually doing something meaningful about it but please do share this competition with everybody else. So this is an interdisciplinary team project. Um, so we're looking for as many students from across disciplines from the built environment as possible. Um, and they're all free to attend. So you can just jump on that Eventbrite um, registration. Hopefully someone pops that in the chat. Um, and there's loads of more information about the actual timeline of the competition, how it all works, the YouTube channel, go and visit either um, Traga's website or the Passive House Trust website. And you'll find lots more information there. So today we are gonna be discussing timber buildings and designing for performance. Um, and performance for us is a big thing at the Passive House Trust. So we're predominantly looking at um, Passive House this evening, um, basically because it's part of the brief as well. So that's kind of a good thing. I'm delighted today that we've got an all female panel, which is incredible considering we're in a, a male dominated field. Um, so that's great news. Uh, we're gonna be looking at what Passive House is. Um, we've got three presentations. So what Passive House is, then we're gonna get into the detail in terms of what kind of things you should be looking for in terms of air tightness, thermal bridging. And then we're gonna jump into a case study to see how that all fits together. Um, We've deliberately kept the presentations relatively short this evening, so it's a bit different to the other webinars, and that's to allow enough time for Q&A. So Passive House has been mentioned previously in some of the other webinars, but today this is the first time that we're actually really gonna get into uh, what it's all about. Um, so while Anna is getting her presentation ready, I'm just gonna give her an introduction. So Anna Carton is from Passive House Homes. She is, um, Passive House Homes are actually one of the sponsors of the competition. Um, she is a designer and architectural, architectural technologist, and she has been um, in low energy buildings uh, for over a decade. She's worked on Passive House and retrofit projects. Um, and she is believing that buildings are inseparable from how a building performs and um, how they look. They're inseparable to making a good building design. Um, so yes, I'm gonna hand over to Anna. Thanks, Yugini. I'm just gonna try and share my screen. Hopefully that's working. Yeah, great. great. Cool, so uh, I'm gonna be talking to everybody about uh, the sort of Passive House basics, and then I'm gonna introduce some design tools. Um, hopefully you've all seen the presentations by Yogini, Sarah, Jasper and Grigor at uh, the previous um, events. Uh, so I'm gonna, like I said, I'm gonna start with a brief reminder of what a Passive House is, uh, look at some of the early design considerations that you should be uh, including in your design process, and then uh, the design tools that you need to uh, get to the Passive House standard. So, um, just uh, a Passive House in its simplest terms is a building that 
requires very little heat demand. So um, as Sarah showed you in one of the presentations, it's behaving more like a thermos flask rather than a coffee machine. And that means you can push heat loss right down. Uh, and in turn, that means that you can reduce the heat load as much as possible as well. So it's underpinned by the idea that the world, we are in a world of finite resources and the cheapest energy and the cheapest carbon mitigation out there is the energy and carbon that you don't use. So just like uh, the first principle of the sustainable hierarchies to reduce um, the passive house, as the passive house institute likes to put it, efficiency is the first renewable. Um, reducing these as far as practicable is at the point where the maximum heat load can be met through the air supply, which is shown by this uh, equation. And uh, because there is a limit on how much you can actually warm air comfortably, that effectively translates to a heat load of 10 watts per meter squared and a heat demand of 15 kilowatt hours per meter squared per annum. And to achieve that, you're going to need to do a number of things. You're going to have to hit certain fabric U values to limit the heat loss from the building and also to maintain surface temperatures to protect the occupant's comfort. You're gonna to need to think about glazing specification to minimize heat loss and also control heat gain. You're gonna to have to make sure there are very high levels of air tightness to minimize as far as possible the heat loss through air leakage. Uh, and that can also help protect the building from moisture issues, particularly in uh, buildings with natural materials and timber structures. You're gonna to have to specify an MBHR system to maintain fresh and clean air which recovers a minimum of 75% of the uh, heat from the stale air that's extracted. And you're also gonna think, have to think about overheating and reduce that as far as possible. Uh, and then lastly on this slide is uh, thermal bridges. So as well as those um, demands, there are also some demands on the primary, what's now called the primary energy renewable, used to be just called the primary energy. Um, and there are three uh, options. There's the classic, which is sort of the old, older standard. Um, and that's normally where you start as a passive house designer. There's the passive house plus where you generate, in theory, you generate as enough uh, electricity to offset your operational use. And then there is the premium standard where you generate more electricity than you need. And that appears to be the one that's most aligned with the competition brief. Uh, and by implementing these strategies, you generate um, that, that generate the low heat demand, you create a whole load of co-benefits, um, as can be seen by this side by the Passive House Trust. Um, and they include things like improved air quality and thermal comfort and health and well-being. And they also help extend the life of the building fabric because it's protected from air leakages, as well as the finishes because the relative humidity in these buildings is very good. Um, and all of this, as well as reducing your operational emissions. Um, and Sarah Lewis mentioned in her presentation that this is obviously a huge step change into how we build, how buildings perform, um, but also a huge step change in the quality of the environments that we're providing. And that requires people across the construction process to work collaboratively and buy into that quality of construction uh, that Passive House dem demands. Um, that's not to say it needs to be difficult, uh, it just needs to be considered and considered at a very early stage. Um, if you'd seen Jasper and Griggle's presentation, you would have seen a graph uh, that talked about uh, starting early, you have lots of opportunities to make it fairly straightforward and affordable. The later you start in the process, uh, those opportunities become limited, it becomes more complex um, and it becomes more expensive. So you want to have a passive house designer on board or you want to understand what you're doing with passive house from a very early stage. So I'm going to rattle through seven uh, early design considerations as quickly as possible. Um, and to start with, a good place to start is form factor. So obviously the more complex your shape, the more envelope you have, uh, the more air surface area there is to lose heat from. So here you can see the most, the more compact shapes have a better form factor, and then things like bungalows have a poorer form factor. Uh, orientation is the next, next thing you might think about. So that's gonna have impacts on, not only on heat loss, which is as shown by this graph, but also uh, on heat gain, so east-west orientations tend to be vulnerable from, for overheating due to the lower sun in the spring and the autumn in particular. Um, occupancy, uh, there is a standard occupancy level uh, for the passive house standard, but in the UK we tend to have higher occupancy level and that can have impacts on things like overheating and also ventilation requirements. Obviously we are all giving off heat and we use things that give off heat, electronic items, and we all use hot water, etc. So that's going to have impacts for how your building might operate, particularly in summer. 
Um, this is one is key as an early consideration. Make sure that you plan for thicker walls. Yeah, your walls are likely to be thicker than you might uh, normally design because you're going to need to achieve higher U value, higher U values. Um, can think about where your air tightness layer is. Think about how you might protect that air tightness layer from follow on trades. Uh, next, glazing. What, uh, what's your glazing per percentage? What are the energy balances? Um, this graph uh, just shows you how, uh, as glazing percentage goes up, which is the sort of dark color lines, you can see that overheating goes up, um, but the actual heat load, or sorry, heat demand in this case, which is the sort of paler color lines, tends to flatten off as that goes up. So the passive house charts recommend 15 to 20% of floor area. So that's a good guide. Uh, then there is MVHR to think about. Where are you going to put it? These machines um, take up space and all the ducts take up space. This is a radial system. You might have a branch system. Uh, this is actually a, what's considered a small MVHR for a two bedroom house, uh, sorry, three bedroom house in this case. Um, uh, so there's a lot of stuff to consider uh, to, to think about where you're going to put it. Um, and then once you've reduced the heat load right down, um, where are you going to put your renewables? What kind of renewables might you think about? Things like air source heat pumps are obviously good in domestic situations because um, they provide more electricity than they use. So as well as some of the higher level macro decisions, you're also going to use one or both of the passive house design tools as early as possible. And uh, the two tools are PHPP and design pH. And uh, PHPP is essentially it's um, an Excel spreadsheet, which I'll go through in just a minute, uh, with a series of tabs that contain all of the equations that underpin the pass fast methodology. And this is the tool that's used for certification. Uh, Design PH is a plugin to sketch up, and that allows you to create a simple mass of your proposed building and apply materials to evaluate its performance against the pass fast criteria. And it has some advantages in terms of shading analysis um, and also seeing quite quickly the visual and thermal implications of design changes. So if you take a window out, you can automatically see what the imp impact is on the building um, visually, but also thermally. So um, I believe that you are going to have a separate uh, workshop with Dave Edwards on Design PH. So I'm going to leave him to that. Um, and I am going to show you uh, some... Um, PHPP. So this is an example of a PHPP. This is an actual project that has one error on it. Um, so it's essentially it's an Excel spreadsheet and it is turning your building into a series of numbers in order to uh, work out what the heat demand is and various other things. And it's made up of a number of worksheets. I mean, there's about 20, there's more than 27 worksheets, but these are the main worksheets and the orange ones are where you put uh, all of the sort of physical properties of the building, you tell it how big it is, what, what the walls are made of, etc. The blue ones are to do with summer summertime operations, so some ventilation and if you have any active cooling. And then the green ones are to do with active sort of heating and uh, electricity systems. So as an example, I'm going to look at the window tab just to give you a sense of how much information you might be inputting. So here you tell it the number of windows of that particular type with that particular code. You tell it the width and the height. You select the wall that it's going in. You tell it what, uh, what glass it has, um, what frame it has. You also tell it whether it's uh, next to another window or if it's on its own, which affects uh, the thermal losses between it and the wall. Um, and that will spit out um, an energy balance. So here you can see some are in, most are actually have a negative en energy balance, even though it's all triple glazing, uh, and some have a positive energy balance. Um, and this sheet sort of has to be viewed in conjunction with the shading sheet, where you tell this uh, model where, how far back the window is installed in the reveal, um, both at the sides and at the head. And you also add some additional shading reduction factors for things like trees, both in winter and summer. So that will obviously be different if there's deciduous trees. Um, so you can see it can get quite granular, which means that you're going to need to know uh, some things about your build building in quite a lot of detail early on. Um, 
but it is important because this is this is a tool rather than an it's both an assessment tool but also it's a design tool and uh, it's important to use this to look at different options and there is uh, there are a number of plugins um, which I'm just going to quickly rattle through because I think I'm running out, happily running out of time. Um, so the first one I am going to show you is the variant variance tool. And this is very useful if you're looking at lots of different options. In this case, this was a project where they uh, were looking at overheating risk. So here you can see the overheating risk got uh, crazy high. Um, this is percentage of annual hours. Uh, here the architect has written a note about what we might do about this. And they've looked at various different scenarios. Um, Another great tool is the Passivars Trust Summer Tab. Uh, this has a really good decision tree on how to avoid summertime overheating. Uh, it also has some design strategies, and then it's a very simple um, sort of yes-no exercise to highlight whether you might have some overheating risk and whether your mitigation strategies are realistic given your location. So I'd highly recommend you getting that tool. Uh, the next tool that I am going to suggest you use if you're using PHPP is the shading, additional shading sheet. So this allows you to just be a little bit more detailed in terms of your shading. Uh, unlike design PH, where you can draw the tree, it's actually physically draw it in and that will provide the shading here. You're sort of trying to make an assessment based on how far away it is, how tall it is, how much transparency it might have. So um, this, this sheet is very useful in terms of making that process a little bit more detailed. And then lastly, and perhaps um, most importantly, is the climate correction tool. Uh, and this is uh, basically because obviously we're in a warming climate and uh, your buildings should live on for the next um, 100 plus years. Um, so they need to be resilient to those weather changes. And the Passifiers Institute have designed a tool where you can basically correct the climate to allow for that additional um, uplift in summertime temperature. It sort of goes from spring to autumn. Um, and they've based it on the previous IPCC report, so not the one that just came out, but the one before that. And they're looking at a one to one and a half degree change. Um, we always do use one and a half degree because we know that measured temperatures are sort of hitting over the 50th percentile. And you can see here, it basically all it does is the dotted line is the the original climate fire, and if I just make it something ridiculous, uh, you can see it goes up in between those months. Um, we tend to see on 1.5, we can see a threefold increase in summertime overheating percentage. So I highly recommend that you use this tool to make sure that you're considering that. So once you've filled in all of your yellow uh, tabs and some of your uh, blue tabs and some of your, your green tabs, um, you are gonna get a result. And that result will be shown on the verification sheet, but also it will be shown uh, in the annual heating tab where you can see where your heat losses are and also your gains. Um, and what you're trying to achieve is a sort of a third, a third, a third. This actually has less than a third on the windows, which is because of the building uh, design. It has these incredibly um, sort of wraparound balconies as these projecting eaves. Um, but it's fine. We're still hitting the right number. Um, if you're an over, over a third on the, the solar gain, then you might be looking at some overheating issues. And uh, so you want, really want to try and keep that down to a third. So back to the presentation, just a reminder that it's the third, a third, third. Um, and some additional resources. So PHPP and Design PH available through the ACB. Uh, the Passivars Trust has endless amounts of really useful guidance um, and obviously lots of training. Uh, Letty is really good for guidance and uh, information on the route to net zero. Passopedia has lots of um, design tips and research papers. Um, and I'm going to sort of skip through the others and then finish with, uh, I highly recommend Sarah Luce's book, PHPP Illustrated. If you're going to use PHPP, it's a very clear step-by-step -step, uh, visual guide and instructions on how to uh, use PHPP and also design pH. So that is me done, I think. Excellent, thank you, Anna. Um, do you just wanna put your video on? Yeah. Sorry, Anna, Anna. yeah, great. Um, so we have a few questions. That's 
really good presentations. The design PH and PHPP in particular are really good tools for actually um, figuring out what your building is doing and how it's working. And for those of you that are scared by the spreadsheet, don't worry. Um, <laughs> it is, it's not as scary initially as, as you think it is. Uh, it's really useful tool, but there's design PH has been designed so that it's a SketchUp plugin that works with PHPP so you can actually look at things in a 3D manner to make decisions quickly and figure out how um, to make those easy wins early on. So you can then get into the granular stage at a later date. Um, so we had a really interesting question um, from Osin Higgins. Um, what techniques are available to manage variable occupancy and activity levels in terms of managing sensible and latent gains? Is that, is, is that a question for me? Yeah. Um, it, uh, actual real life techniques or, te or things that you can do in the modeling tool? I think in the modeling tool. So, so there, how do we manage occupancy and changing? Yeah. Activity? So you can, you, can, uh, you can actually choose the occupancy um, and you can, on the, I think, on the variance tab, look at that. Um, it's a, it's a, I, I don't know what the answer is for design PH, but for PHPP, you can, you can actually change it and then look at the results. And then you have to change it back to then look at what you get for the certification. Yeah, Florence, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I was just going to say, and then there's a non-resi tab, a non-residential tab for non-residential buildings. And I think you can put in profiles for uh, different types of uses as well. Um, yeah. So that. I, I'm pretty sure you can't do that in design PH though. It has to be in PHPP. So design mm -hmm. PH is more the early kind of stages where you're looking at form and the math. It doesn't really go into that. Um, um, and then also, when is PHP people likely to integrate the latest data from the IPCC? Um, so there is a new update on the horizon for PHPP. It's been in development for a really long time. We've been waiting for it for quite a few years now, I think. Um, but so, so I think that's happening this year, and that is going to have new climate data. Don't know if anybody else knows any more about that. I think the German one is coming out this this year, and then they're going to start working on the translation straight away. Yeah, so soon is the answer to that. Soon, yeah. <laughs> Great, thanks, I, I imagine lots of the plugins that I showed are probably going to become standard as well within integration. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Great, um, and also a lot of those plugins are available from the Passive House Trust website as well. So if you go to the design tools, you'll see a whole list of them um, located on there at the moment. So we're gonna jump straight into Florence's um, presentation. So Florence is a mechanical services engineer by training. She's worked at Arup, um, working on lots of really interesting projects, advising architects and clients on how to reduce energy demand in buildings. Um, and also how to use energy efficiently within those buildings themselves. Um, she is really interested in the performance gap due to a lot of um, post-occupancy evaluations, which have shown that not all buildings necessarily uh, perform in real life um, compared to their actual design intentions. Um, so yes, oh, and she's also set up her own consultancy just now. So. Um, it's really exciting time. So over to you, Florence. Oh, thanks, Yegini. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm just going to uh, share my screen and watch the presentation. Does that work? Yeah. Yeah, great. So, yes, so I've, um, I've set up uh, my company, Humble Bee, about three and a half years ago. Uh, as Yogini said, I'm a, a mechanical engineer um, and also a certified passive house designer. Um, and I quickly came to uh, the realization that passive house was pretty much the only uh, energy standard that actually did what it uh, said on the tin. So uh, that's why I'm here today after a, quite a long stint at Arup. <laughs> uh, 
Um, and a couple of years ago, um, we got into uh, looking at timber um, through a competition called uh, Home of 2030. And you might have heard my colleague, um, Adrian Campbell from Change Building talk about uh, regenerative design. Uh, and with Patrick Osborne and at Perpendicular, we formed the Positive Collective. So um, I wear several hats, but um, definitely uh, my focus tonight will be on, on performance and uh, building services. Um, and we came together obviously to, to bring building solutions that addressed uh, multiple crises. So uh, climate breakdown, societal uh, inequality and biodiversity loss um, in a positive way. Um, I've lost the regression term. <laughs> I think I need to move this out now. Right. Um, so how do we design buildings that perform? I think uh, as long as you keep the, the user at the center of it, um, um, but nature at the heart of it, you will um, you won't go too far wrong, um, but certainly having PHPP and the tools that we have for Passive House uh, will, um, will help you bridge this uh, performance gap that we've talked about. Uh, and that's because of a rigor of modeling and a rigor of, of process and evidence-based. Um, and we'll get onto some of the evidence that you're, um, you're obliged to give as part of certification. Um, and you've been given a, um, a task, which is to design a, an 800 square meter community center. Um, and it's on a greenfield site, which um, poses its own, uh, let's, let's say intellectual challenges. A lot of people will um, object to greenfield um, sites being used for, for new development. Um, and there's a, and there's a reason for that because you know development so far hasn't been that great at um, looking after uh, nature and our environment um, and also uh, people. So really, what we're asking you to do is is go beyond sort of net zero and um, make sure that um, what it is you do. Uh, is in harmony with, with the environment that you do it in. Um, and you'll have, you might have heard um, Adrian talk about this model of uh, reusing, making circular economy within building um, and uh, producing more energy possibly uh, than you're um, intending to use. Um, and that would be a really good way to mitigate and go beyond the fact that you're uh, on a greenfield site. Um, so how do you do that? Um, well, it, the reason we have uh, a, a carbon impact of building is because we use materials, but also um, we have to heat those buildings. And the idea is to reduce that heating uh, demand as far down as possible, uh, and also the hot water that you, that you will need to provide um, so that that can be compensated through uh, a renewable energy on site um, in some way. And if, if you're thinking of being off grid, then um, of, um, getting that demand down as, as much as possible is, um, is crucial. So you've, you've heard the uh, Passive House principles. Um, so I'm going to concentrate on um, uh, three of those. The, the, for, the form factor is uh, basically the amount of, um, uh, of heat loss area compared with the amount of uh, treated area inside uh, that you're having to heat. So uh, both form and orientation are what I call passive house for free. Anything, if you get that right, uh, then you don't have to work so hard on all the other elements to, um, to reduce your, your demands. Um, so you've got that luxury with a new build, um, but you still have to look after um, all the other uh, small details that will make up the heat demand of your building. So we're going to go through and look at air tightness, um, thermal bridging and, um, and the ventilation strategy. 
So passive house thermal performance um, is achieved uh, by adhering to certain principles. And if you if you stuck to just um, an internal layer of uh, as, as in a services zone, uh, then your structure, uh, then your insulation, and then your weatherproofing, um, then you won't go far wrong. So that's the most simple, simple model um, that you would have uh, in terms of your construction. Um, as, as you design the building in, in more detail, you'll end up with structural elements. And in fact, you might end up with some kind of panelized system where structure and insulation are, are grouped together. And that's where um, sort of thermal bridging might, might actually come into um, your passive house design. Um, what's a thermal bridge? It's essentially a short circuit for heat. Um, so you might have insulated the walls and the roof and the floor, but there's a junction there and you might have some piece of um, structural uh, element um, between the two. And so in order to have a, um, in order to avoid that sort of short circuiting, um, you need to make sure that that's um, insulated in some way. And you can see from those contour lines um, that something that's not well treated as a thermal bridge, uh, the contours, the temperatures are very quickly um, uh, going down through that bridge and it affects the surface temperature in that corner. Uh, whereas a nice, uh, well insulated um, thermal bridge, well, it ends up not being a thermal bridge because it's well insulated. And you can see how those contour lines are pushed out to the outside edge of the uh, structure. Um, and avoiding thermal bridges, the easiest thing to, well, the, the rigorous thing to do is to take a felt tip pen through your section and make sure that you've got a continuous insulation line all the way around that section in all, uh, in all the cases, but you might end up um, as we said, um, with uh, a particular construction detail, so say the eaves um, with a glue lamp. Uh, this is a glue lamp um, beam across the, the ridge and timber, although it is um, much more insulating than uh, steel or concrete, it's still a, some kind of cold bridge and also the, the web structures of the of any truss element um, in a panelized system will, will present a, a thermal bridge. So you, you need to just analyze those and take those into account. Um, just quickly, um, the Passive House Convention is uh, that if you have at least two thirds of your insulation thickness wrapping around an, uh, a structural element, then you can basically take that as, um, as thermal bridge free. Um, what was I going to say? I was also going to say, um, if you do have to calculate a, a thermal bridge, then it's, uh, it's called a psi value. And essentially it's a correction factor because um, when you calculate the heat losses of your building, you apply new values to a certain uh, heat loss area. Um, and then the psi value just gives you a correction to those assumptions of, of um, what areas you've, you've applied it to. Now, in building regulations, you would take the internal dimension, which is a small dimension, and apply the E value to that, to that dimension. Um, so in building regulations conventions, it's almost always an additional heat loss in your calculations, whereas in passive house convention, uh, we take the external um, uh, surface area and apply the U-value across that dimension. Um, so sometimes it might even be a, a negative uh, value. Um, yeah, so that's how that's done. Um, another uh, aspect of Passive House that needs real attention in the construction detail is the airtightness of the building. Um, and when we talk about air tightness, we're talking about a, a continuous barrier to the passage of air um, 
not necessarily vapor. Um, so sometimes the air tightness layer is also is actually vapor permeable, so you allow uh, the construction elements to breathe. Um, but it does wrap all around the building, and you need to be careful not to uh, pierce it too often. <laughs> <clears throat> but if you have services coming in, um, there are certain ways of, of dealing with that. Um, and air tightness is a measure of how uh, leaky your building is. Um, so uh, air tightness and air permeability are sometimes spoken about in similar ways, although I guess one's the exact opposite of the other. <laughs> uh, if it's airtight, it's not permeable. Um, but in building regs, we talk about air permeability um, and uh, it's expressed in certain, um, with certain units. Um, and this is all, this is a, a sort of measure that's done through a test um, and under pressure. So um, it's um, you pressurize the building and you find out uh, where those uh, leaks are uh, coming from and it gives you a, a value on which to build, uh, on which to um, calculate infiltration. Now the difference is infiltration is what you have, not necessarily under pressure, but um, it gives you an added load and it's uncontrolled flow of air from cracks and gaps in the construction. And it's a heat load because you've basically got outside air, cold outside air coming into your um, building uh, that you then have to bring up to room temperature along with everything else. And it's important um, because once you've tightened your entire building in terms of um, insulation uh, and you've got the right orientation, etc. Then it does become does represent quite a large um, part of your heat losses. So on the left is a these are these are analyses for a church hall building. So not not too dissimilar uh, to what you're looking at. Um, and the one on the left has reasonable U values, um, double glazing, uh, but it also has what in the industry they would say is quite a um, quite low air permeability or quite high air tight tightness at three. Um, building regs is five uh, on, the, um, uh, on the notional building and can go up to 10. So you can see how uh, going down to passive house levels of air tightness represents quite a large jump from there. Um, so in passive house terms, we talked about, talk about air changes per hour. Um, and that's to do with the volume, whereas uh, in building regs terms, you would talk about a leakiness of air through the envelope um, surfaces in meters cube per hour per square meter of uh, this area. Um, I don't know how I'm doing for time, nearly there. Um, so, but one thing we do need is actual control ventilation and that's um, provided through um, mechanical ventilation of heat recovery. Um, and I think uh, we've covered that in the previous talk. So I will just um, briefly mention that um, once you've got all your um, uh, heat loads down to the passive house level uh, you need to then decide on your heat source um, and in a climate emergency you won't be going for any fossil fuels um, so you'll be looking at uh, electricity based solutions and um, when we designed home of 2030 we made the assumption that we would have a relatively decarbonized grid by then so we we did go for direct electricity for um, heating. So one kilowatt hour of electricity goes to one kilowatt hour of, of heating. But I think in a modern building these days, um, you would definitely be uh, involving heat pump technology uh, in your designs because of, um, because of their efficiency. Um, so for one kilowatt hour of electrical energy, you would get three to four um, of heating energy and with price rises that are coming in um, every kilowatt hour of electricity that you can save uh, will definitely be 
in running cost terms um, a huge, um, hugely beneficial. So I've got you, one minute. Yeah, so uh, that's my last slide. Um, so can you make a carbon positive uh, off grid uh, type uh, building? Well, uh, it's it can be done and you've got the tools to do it with the passive house PHPP um, and you can aim for those plus and premium um, categories if you, uh, if you can work out the electricity demands and then uh, compensate that with your on-site renewables. So hopefully that will have given you a bit of a whirlwind tour of the building services aspects and, and air tightness and thermal vision. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you, Florence. Um, so there is one question. I, I'll just comment as well with the plus and the premium standards. Um, so for the competition, we're asking for With the plus and premium, basically to generate energy uh, via renewable station is encouraging for participants to do. So there's no, there's nothing stopping any of the students from going for those additional standards. That'd be amazing to see. Um, if you've got aspirations for that, that'd be great. Um, we have one question here, um, which is if you've got a particularly exposed site, so this is regarding air type and testing. Is there any merit to running a blower door test at a delta P um, greater than 50 pascals? Um, I think actually the passive house test, and but don't quote me on this, um, is actually you go beyond the 50 pascals anyway, you get sort of a, a line um, from below and above 50 pascals, maybe even up to 100 pascals, I can't remember. Um, but I think, so um, it, it is a design tool in that it's benchmarking buildings across the board at that particular level. What the building in that particularly uh, high exposure location uh, will do is probably require a little bit more heat in, in some cases um to run and so you might be on you, know, you might be if you were to maintain 20 degrees all year round which we don't necessarily um then you might find you you're just heating it a little bit more than you would expect um yeah. so, uh, but i don't think it gives you any more information it's just something you're aware of as a way Great. Um, so we are going to have more questions um, after we've heard from Polly. So please do put them in the chat. Um, and thank you, Florence, for that. That was great. Um, so next up is Polly Upton, and she is a senior architect at Archetype. If you have not heard of Archetype, um, please do go check them out. They are a Passive House Trust pioneer in the UK. They have been involved in so many Passive House projects from the get-go in the UK um, and they've been doing it for over a decade and they do it really well. They're always pushing projects. Um, they've done everything from small self builds all the way up to um, big kind of enterprise centres and educational buildings and large-scale housing um, projects as well. Um, so Polly is going to show a case study, which is Passive House Timber Building. Um, she is a senior architect and she's worked on several um, scales across um, the board. Uh, she's specialised in renovation and ecological retrofit, um, which is not something we're really going to touch upon for the project, but um, it's nevertheless one of the more interesting things I think that we need to be addressing. So over to you, Polly. Okay, I'll just uh, share my screen. Uh, can everybody see that? Yes. Yep. Okay, so um, uh, I'm just going to very quickly run through who Archetype uh, are on our history. Um, we're a very, um, uh, very, we are a, a practice that specializes in, in sort of environmental and social sustainability um, and have um 
quite a long history of uh, timber frame environmentally um, conscious buildings. Um, so I'm not going to I'm not going to read out all of the uh, all of the points on these slides, but just point out a few a few of our projects. The um, the hedgehog self build bottom of the screen is uh, um, part of our roots is a um, Walter Siegel inspired timber frame housing project. I think it was built in the 80s and is still going strong. Um, and then the image at the top is a uh, completed in the last few years as a social housing scheme in Shropshire. Again, timber frame, passive house. Um, uh, we also have worked on sort of the kind of um, slightly uh, what people call hairier and hippier end of the uh, scale, as you can kind of see with the Horniman Museum, which was a really experimental project. And um, at the bottom, the Sutton Academy, which is um, a really, really massive, uh, high quality, polished, um, passive house secondary school um, in London. So across uh, lots of different sort of scales and styles. Um, we've also worked quite a lot on uh, developing innovative um, solutions um, to timber frame projects. The the image at the top is um, wasn't a past house project, but we uh, developed a Welsh made Brecht uh panel for our Coed uh, visitor centre project in Wales um, uh, quite a few years ago now. But um, uh, yeah, sort of timber and timber innovation are part of our part of our fabric really. Um, the case study that I'm going to talk to you about today is actually not an archetype project, but is um, uh, a personal project. M myself and my partner, Kirk, we both work for archetype. We've um, worked for archetype since before the practice was doing passive house. So we're kind of very much uh, um, ingrained into our work and our processes, but we were living in a um, a leaky Victorian house in Hereford. So thought actually um, we'd quite like to live in one of these buildings that we're you know, preaching about and designing for other people. So um, uh, this is recently completed. It's a passive house, timber frame and self-built-ish in that we didn't physically build it ourselves, but we designed and project managed it. Um, so this is it last summer um, with on a very hot sunny day and the big sliding shutters across the massive west facing sliding doors for shading. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of the sort of the passive house principles we we looked at with this building. Um, we chose the site uh, partially because it had this incredible view towards the lower end of uh, Hatterall Hill but that was directly west facing from the site which kind of in terms of passive house presents um, potential challenges, but uh, they can be overcome. Um, the site also has quite a constrained access. Um, uh, if anybody's local and knows it, it's in Pontrilus between Hereford and Abergavenny, and there's this small low railway tunnel underneath the, uh, well, obviously underneath the railway that you have to access to get to the site. So. Um, in terms of moving materials uh, onto the site for construction, it it, uh, it gave us a few uh, issues. Um, so that very much led us towards doing timber frame. Um, very, very basically the, um, it's timber frame structure. So it's um, uh, timber eye joists and eye beams for the walls, external walls and roof and internal floors, which are uh, sheathed with um, a wood fibre board on the outside, breathe membrane, breathe membrane and then the cladding. Then inside there's a, a vapour block board, which does the air tightness um, of the building. Um, the uh, foundations uh, we have um, were persuaded uh, goaded into uh, trying a concrete free foundation by Nick Grant, who many of you in the Passive House community will know well. Um, he'd been trying to get someone to do it for ages, um, and we were, uh, yeah, gullible enough to try it, but it's worked out well um, in that we've not got any concrete in the building 
uh, at all. The, the foundations are uh, a foam glass perimeter strip um, with the timber sole plate sat on top of them, very basically. So um, this is the section of the, of the house as well. Um, the uh, bedrooms, bathrooms are on the ground floor um, with the uh, MVHR unit located down there. And then on the middle floor, we've got our open plan kitchen living room. And then in the upper, um, upper floor, we've got a kind of office uh, um, casual space and storage. Um, so it uses up um, the whole of the sort of inside of the envelope is, is habitable. Um, uh, we, we needed the design to be uh, kind of quick uh, and simple to construct because we were on quite a tight budget and also um, the builder was um, my brother who had never built a house before um, but was entirely capable of doing it um, and in terms of passive house it's always good to try and keep the details and things as simple as you can. Um, so uh, in terms of the design, we um, applied the you know the good but the good uh, principles of passive house that have been talked about in the other two presentations tonight. Um, good orientation. So this is photo shows the south facing elevation, um, uh, which has its temporary uh, summer shading on the ground floor openings because we hadn't by that point installed the brisele, which will go in front of there. Uh, and you can see the, uh, the large overhang of the roof, which is um, demonstrating the shading of the windows on the first floor, uh, which is something that we um, modeled with pH ribbon um, to make sure that we were kind of uh, maximizing the, the openings for views and daylighting, but also not making them so big that we would um, suffer from overheating. Um, the detailing in terms of the timber frame um, and connections are very simple, very robust. They're a, a typical archetype approach to doing a timber frame. Um, uh, the insulation in the walls is um, 300 mil of uh, cellulose, uh, so recycled newspaper insulation. Uh, I think I've been through the, the other build up before. Um, in a, uh, so yeah, that that's kind of just shows the sort of the basic uh, principles of that. And in the dashed red line, as uh, I think um, Florence highlighted, that you've got this basic diagram of where your air tightness uh, line is on the inside on that on that vapor block. Um, and drawing that on is a really good uh, principle for for checking it. Um, thermal bridges were. were minimized because um, the timber frame, um, nothing projects out past the, the insulation zone. Um, and the timber structure was uh, a very kind of simple and efficient um, build in that it's all um, lengths of timber eye joist, um, excuse me. Uh, that can be quickly assembled on site, very, very quickly assembled on site um, with minimal um, handling um, and can be, you know, they're quite uh, light compared to their structural capacity. Um, in terms of the structural design, the having the living floors on the uh, upper floor really benefited because the openings could be bigger uh, there, there and therefore that meant that those sort of less load bearing elements on the ground floor um, and this, the connections were all really standard just uh, wood screws and a few uh, joist hangers and metal straps here and there so um, the whole of the sort of design decision making or technical design decision making process was about keeping things as simple and as uh, buildable as we possibly could. Um, so we started on site January 2020 um, and we had a big, big hole in the ground um, for, for a few weeks. And then um, we had uh, a lot of groundworks in terms of getting all the drainage and stuff in. But then um, this photo shows the uh, 
concrete free foundations going in, which is basically um, a footing of compacted recycled aggregate, uh, quite fine, uh, that um, then has a, a bed of uh, NHL lime mortar on top of it. And then foam glass blocks were stacked and staggered uh, and adhered together with the DPM on top of it. One of the reasons we chose that was because we didn't think at that point we could get a concrete lorry, and we still can't, uh, under the railway tunnel to to uh, to get concrete in for foundations. So um, that constraint really forced us into sort of thinking a little bit differently as well about how we procure materials. Um, uh, so timber sole plate going on again. It's just uh, adhered down in the end, just sitting down onto the DPM. Um, and this was sort of between, uh, I think, is it Storm Dennis and Kira? So we had a massive amount of rain on the site, but actually the uh, the, the drain, uh, French drains around the perimeter of the um, foundation were keeping it really, really dry, which was uh, encouraging to see at that stage. Um, yeah, so timber frame up went up very quickly, but um, as uh, my brother uh, was a little bit unhappy about the, the amount of times he had to go keep going around the building, wrapping it and wrapping it and wrapping it with the different layers. He wasn't quite anticipating that it would be um, quite that process heavy. So the, the photo on the top right is where the project had got down, got to before lockdown. So it's pretty much... Um, watertight without the windows and doors in. Um, so there's just a few photographs of um, the timber frame going up and the sheathing boards and breather membrane going on. Um, uh, getting the detailing right in terms of the windows uh, and the cladding is, is quite key. We um, deliberately set the windows quite far back into the structure so that um, uh, we could benefit from for a bit of shading from from the depth of the um, uh, of the the whole wall build up, and then um, making sure that you've got uh, good, uh, well constructed, um, easy lines of uh, fabric to be doing your air tightness taping to, which round windows is, and doors is your main uh, weak points uh, within the building. So it's good to keep that as simple as possible to get that right. Um, the uh, because we'd done the concrete free foundations, we then had to deal with the, the floor junction internally. Um, so the, the, the building is split into three bays effectively, and then you've kind of got these floating <coughs> uh, rafts of um, insulation uh, sitting on the DPM, DPM taped up to the vapor block. So again, you've got a really kind of clear. Uh, line of um, junction um, so that hopefully you can keep tabs on, on where any air leakage might come through um, but also being uh, careful to not damage things like the DPM which went down on top of one of the layers of insulation. Um, this slide is about uh, air tightness and actually the insulation so on the um, the, the picture that's sort of in the middle of the image the uh, shows some yellow lines and some yellow circles where which indicates to the person installing the insulation where the studs are with the yellow lines uh, the eye joist timber structures are and then the circles as in where roughly to uh, drill a hole into that vapor block board so that the um, cavity can then be pumped full of insulation and then uh, taped over. So it's kind of a quite a good QA check to mark it all out. Um, and then uh, uh, quite easy to check once you've gone through um, see that the uh, insulation installer has done it. Um, in terms of um, other penetrations, we had sort of very few other penetrations through the fabric. There was um, uh, one drainage, one I think going through, or two through going through the ground floor, and one through one of the external walls, and then um, a couple for the air source heat pump and MVHR units. Um, 
and uh, we chose to do this again, trying to economize um, instead of buying pre-made grommets the right size of the um, the penetrations. We we just used a sheet of EPM that we bought from a builder's merchant and then all taped on with the uh, air tightness tape, which is the blue tape that you can see everywhere. Uh, and then the blue uh, tape uh, again on the, you can see on the vapor block, uh, the green boards is where the joints between the boards are. They're all securely taped. Um, so I think the air tightness test, we got 0.4 uh, at the passive house measurement, which was uh slightly better than the, the standard um uh, 0.6 that that is sort of the the baseline but um lots of passive house buildings these days are getting much better than that um and this is it uh a few uh, yeah just a couple of images of the the internal materials we wanted it to have quite a sort of a simple crafted feeling but on a budget um so we use things like um a gypsum um universal one coat so white plaster instead of the pink which meant that we could have that as kind of um final finish with a coat of uh, coated it in osmo um, just to stop it dusting and then really simple sort of plywood uh linings um one of the uh one of my uh colleagues at Archetype, Sonia, she's just been doing her master's dissertation on the house, um, uh, comparing lots of different carbon um, analysis tools. So she's done a, I think this one's come out of pH ribbon. Um, and even with the uh, metal cladding, it um, has, I think the in terms of upfront carbon, it's about a 40% reduction on the Letty target and whole life there. 60% reduction. Um, and then uh, I think as you can kind of see here, the external walls are the biggest uh, carbon, um, uh, I can't, I've lost the word anyway, but um, all of the other materials are quite are quite sort of low carbon intensive. So um, yeah, we didn't set out with that intention, but it's um, through, Sort of intuitive choices that we've made through our experience at archetype we've we we kind of approached that and it's kind of nice to nice to see um how that came out um so that is a very brief uh whistle stop tour through what was quite a uh sort of intense project for us but um yeah thank you for listening that was amazing thank you polly um i just have to applaud you for concrete proof foundations yay <laughs> <laughs> Um, brilliant. Um, do all the rest of the panel want to put their videos back on? So we've got time now just for a, um, a quick panel roundup, basically. Um, and I want to get an opinion from everybody just on what are the main things to look out for when you're designing passive house standard with timber. Um, and we all know that passive house sometimes gets, you know, deemed as this magical unicorn that solves everything and it's not it deals predominantly with energy efficiency and reducing the amount of energy that you need um but what are the key and it, and it also tackles that performance gap so it eliminates um the performance gap and you're actually getting things that you're designing to in reality and that's based on this really rigorous q a standard the quality assurance standard throughout the process from concept all the way through construction to when it's actually complete and those spreadsheets and the you know the the detail that we go into might seem um a bit ott like over the top but actually that's how you get a building to perform to where you want it to be so you can build a passive house out of anything but is there anything in particular that you need to like consider or look for? Or what, what's one thing that you would be more mindful of when you're designing with timber? Anna, let's start with you. Uh, I'm gonna say moisture. So you really need to think about how you're gonna manage uh, moisture, which is also related to how you manage air tightness, because um, if you do get interstitial condensation, so that's condensation within the building structure, wall build up 
is most likely got there through air transport. Um, but you also need to think about vapour permeability and uh, always making sure that your building can dry out. So uh, normally to the outside, there are some intelligent membranes that you can use where they can dry both ways. Um, but you definitely don't want to be locking up your timber structure in uh, by putting a vapour block on both sides um, because any moisture that gets in there then can't get out and it might sort of accumulate. So yeah, that would yeah. be one thing. I think that's it. Uh, moisture is such an underrated issue as well for most buildings. I think Passive community are like really aware of it, but a lot of other people don't give it enough um, attention, and particularly with retrofit and things as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Lauren, what do you want to take away? Um, so I think it's important to realise carbon impacts of the whole building. So that's where timber really, you know, from a sustainable source can really come into its own. Um, but to remember, it's still, there's still bits of structure. <laughs> which you, um, take care of and um and it will have you know it will be a cold bridge uh, of some sort so that but, you know that just needs to be taken into account in the new value calculation and the thermal bridging um but also but there are opportunities and you know wood fiber for example as an insulation material is also um, quite dense, so you will get some thermal mass from that. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean a very lightweight building. Um, and so thinking about how that impacts, and you know, the summer overheating case as well. Um, but yeah, lovely material, really. <laughs> to, yeah, no, for sure. In body <laughs> carbon is is definitely becoming a, a much bigger factor that we all need to be looking at. Um, and timber just lends itself so well to dealing with those issues. I mean, obviously it's not perfect when you think about sourcing and you know how we're getting those materials, where it's all coming from. Um, so those are big kind of impacts that are gonna have, um, you know, you need to consider those when you're looking at things. And I think Beth Williams did a really good presentation um, few days ago this webinar series looking at structural impacts and and where you might look at other alternative materials not just necessarily the the things that we're used to in this country like masonry and steel <laughs> so <laughs> go and check out that webinar holly what's your one takeaway for timber and passive house um i think keep the <laughs> keep the sort of the envelope design simple um timber can do a lot but um it's and it's forgiving uh, in that you know if you accidentally mess, mess up a few dimensions when you're constructing it it's quite easy to rectify but um yeah i think i think keep keep the detailing simple in in terms of you know not too many in in the in the outy bits make it make it easy to keep to make it airtight and um uh so that you can you know you can kind of do checks on the critical the critical junctions i think also in terms of construction moisture um i think moisture in use is one thing that we talk about a lot but one thing that um is absolutely critical is, is moisture during construction and making sure that buildings have enough time to dry out not necessarily uh particularly relevant to this this uh design competition really but um it is worth considering in terms of um the uh how you design the building and you know if you if you have flat roofs and things like that you, it's potential for chopping moisture before you've even occupied the building so yeah moisture and movement or subsequent movement because of moisture and <laughs> <laughs> uh, and i just wanted to shout out to your brother poor brother who's like been thrown into this passive house project <laughs> did he get any specific training or was it just um being led by you guys because you've got your passive house knowledge how did that work uh yeah it was quite a unique experience i think in that he because he lived quite a far away at the time he basically lived with us in the week and we would have very intense design discussions every evening um and 
then he would you know retire to the sofa to watch youtube videos <laughs> so <laughs> it was amazing is you know uh for uh, you know your first new build project he did incredibly well yeah yeah and I, yeah you're, you're just from the images that you showed there you can definitely tell that it was really slick and simple in terms of the design and how you sequence things it's really clear so that obviously helped quite a lot or maybe it was a necessity because you, <laughs> your brother was built oh, brilliant um and does anyone want to mention tapes like air tightness tapes because they're not all the same and you know are they slightly different for timber compared to something else yeah there's a there's a, a whole range of tapes out there to get to get confused by um some tapes are for timber to timber some are for timber to uh masonry some get embedded in plaster some are for outside um some are for <laughs> near the near the dpc so the, the list is um, is quite long, uh, but th there's a huge variety out there. There's sort of two main producers of tapes at the moment, um, and they have those suites of tapes within their ranges, and they have really long uh, sort of guarantees on them. So they're very robust things. Once it's stuck, it's stuck. Um, and yeah, they're very incredibly useful in um, timber buildings. Well, in all, all buildings where you're looking to do air tightness, but if you're not using wet plaster everywhere to as your air tightness, then um, and you're using a board, for example, then yeah, invaluable. Yeah, definitely. And some great and guidance by the. Got... Sorry, I was going to say great guidance by the uh, manufacturers of the tapes for yeah. where to apply them. Yeah, they've got some really good videos as well in terms of how you actually yeah. stick them on. That's really important. Um, and has anyone got any kind of tips or tricks in terms of efficiency? So we look at like using timber as this really nice product, but actually making material efficiency seems to be something that we need to look at a bit more. So does anyone, has anyone had an experience of that or looking into that? Anna, I know you're doing a load of stuff with pH ribbon and looking at the embodied carbon of stuff. Does, yeah that so uh yeah i mean so we, we we do put our buildings um through ph ribbon and i was hoping to talk about it but i ran out of time uh so we obviously work with an i uh joist i stud system a bit like polly's house uh, just slightly different details and we do that partly because you're reducing the um timber fraction through the structure, so the thermal losses, but also you're using less stuff. And um, people can think, oh, I'm sequestering lots of carbon by putting lots of timber in my building, but it's a natural resource and uh, we should be using it sparingly because taking it out of the forest has all sorts of consequences. Um, so you want to be using it efficiently, not just for the thermal performance of the building, but also for body carbon reasons and biodiversity reasons. Um, so I think it's uh, critical not to overuse timber and use timber correctly. So use the right kind of timber. Uh, Florence probably can say more about this <laughs> uh, being, um, on the engineering side, but use the right kind of timber in the right place. So if you need something that's going to do a lot of structural uh, work then use something that's um, got that capacity if you need something that's just sort of there to fill out the wall then use something that that, that doesn't is incredibly strong um, yeah so. Lawrence did you want to jump in um, I was just gonna say when we looked at positive house we we did a balloon frame structure um, we worked with Rob Hairston's actually um, and it was a it was CLT on the inside, but we were working with, so the, the, the idea was to have homegrown timber uh, and homegrown timber we can only get up to certain grades. So it's not necessarily sort of the C24s that you have for mass timber, it's uh, C16, is that right, Rob? <laughs> um, and, um, and so there, I guess there's a bit of a balance as well in terms of, um, thanks Tab. <laughs> in terms of um, uh, where you get the timber from, you know, do you 
but obviously we're trying to create a market and I don't know how far sort of wood knowledge Wales have got to, for example, which isn't too far um, in terms of getting that supply chain um, uh, up and running really. So yeah, there's lots of, there's lots of swings and roundabouts on, on that. Um, and there's also, I mean, it is, it is combustible at the end of the day. So you will need some, some kind of fire uh, strategy and part of that strategy might well be a sacrificial layer of some sort or encapsulation or that kind of thing. So it's, yeah, I mean, building design is not, is not straightforward by any means, but um, keeping it simple where you can definitely is a, is a good strategy. Great. Just yeah. on, the, on, the, on the fire thing, if I just wanted to add to that. Um, obviously there's been a, huge clampdown on, on uh, fire regulations and people get nervous about timber and fire, but timber tends to char, not, not ignite. Um, and there's all sorts of fun videos out there of people trying to set fire to wood fiber boards. Um, we had a client who tried to set fire to cellulose, blown in cellulose insulation with a blowtorch and it, it burns, but it doesn't ignite. So um, whilst you do need to have perhaps a sacrificial layer or uh, you need to think about obviously meeting the regulations, um, I don't think people, um, uh, just because it, it's timber doesn't mean it's firewood. <laughs> it's, it's very yeah. different things. Shouldn't be, shouldn't be scared of it. That's... No. <laughs> I think we've got another session later on in the webinar series that deals with um, fire in particular. Um, and I think Tab's already put in the at the homegrown timber on the 24th of February. So with transforming timber, do come along to that one. Um, we haven't been inundated with questions, which is amazing because your presentations have just been so clear. Um, there's one comment on, um, does anyone have a comment on variable vapor diffusion membrane, um, their availability and their performance? and also the longevity of these tapes and membranes. Um, so uh, longevity is about 60 to 100 years, depending on what you're using. And intelligent membranes, we use something called Intello. Um, so the idea that it's uh, vapor diffusion changes according to the temperature inside and outside. Um, and they work very well. You just got to use them in the right place. Um, I haven't uh, come across the Rotherblast one, but I'm gonna guess it to something very similar. And they kind of, there's, they're sort of invaluable on things like flat roofs where you have to have obviously something on the outside that's going to completely block vapor from escaping in a vertical direction. Yeah. Um, and then leading on from that, there's this whole um, issue with the flexibility of the building. Obviously, once you've got all your structure and your membranes and everything in place, um, how to design for more flexible open spaces with power. I guess try and keep it as simple as possible again and just yeah. make sure that the envelopes are doing all your hard work and so yeah. you've got flexibility within the internal spaces to change things around. And as Florence showed in her slide, you keep the you keep things separate, you know, you keep you have the structure, then you have the insulation, or sometimes they combine, um, and then you have the air tightness, then and the, the service you try not to integrate things that have different lifespans so that they can be uh, updated as the building gets older. Yeah. And completely different when you're looking at retrofit, obviously. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's really tough. Yeah. yeah. Um, windows and glazed walls, is there a rule of thumb for each in terms of orientation? Yes. Let's see a guide on this. Um, but does it does he mean sort of percentage of glazing for north versus south versus yeah i guess so in terms of you, you definitely don't want to put too much north glazing no uh, yeah you're going to get more heat loss on the north obviously mm. and for me it's just be careful of east west because yeah i was going to yeah. say that <laughs> yeah yeah so you can That's easily shame. shade yeah exactly <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I think there is um 
in our rules of thumb, there, it, there are certain kind of criteria that we've tried to put in in terms of percentages for glazing factors and um, that kind of thing. But there isn't, it, each project is different. You've just got to assess what's around you. So, you know, you're designing for context, not just singular block in the middle of nowhere. So you've got to think about what's around you and shading and how that all works. So good design is about context, not just an individual thing that's on camera. Um, great. I think. Matt, can can I ask a question? Yeah, go for it. Can I ask Polly a question? Um, uh, amazing project, by the way. I, how did you get an engineer to sign off on the concrete three? <laughs> and good how question. did you get an engineer to sign off on? Adhe adhering the base plates <laughs> well, uh, well it was the same engineer fortunately um, okay. <laughs> so we used uh, a engineer called Andrew Collinson who's uh, local um, local to us in Herefordshire and um, we I think he had previously been discussing uh, like we had with Nick this principle of um, a concrete free foundation and um he he was he was quite happy with it it didn't you know he didn't have any concerns he, you know in terms of in principle he was happy that it would all work and then the um but obviously th then it comes down to how it how it's constructed you need to be very careful how you're doing it we, mm -hmm. we did hear afterwards after a few building control inspections that they'd have to have a special uh building control meeting <laughs> in the department to say whether they were decide whether they were going to uh, accept it <laughs> but um yeah andrew is quite work quite um yeah relaxed he, seemingly about it maybe he's not in, inside now but i think he yeah yeah it was it was it was quite straightforward in terms of him doing the calculations and because basically it's just effectively a ring beam uh all kind of locking together on on one level if, as long as you've got the level level it, it's not going to move anywhere so yeah um, so we do have one final question, I think. Um, it is, um, Ali has got his hand up. So Ali, if you could just unmute and ask your Hello. question. Hi. Hi there. Uh, thank you for your presentations. Um, I just, I was actually just in the middle of writing it, but it's much easier to just. Um, so I noticed, um, Florence, in one of your diagrams, you had installation on the outside of structure. And I'm so used to seeing in details, for example, the insulation going in the timber frame or on the inside of the masonry wall. Is there a conscious, was that a conscious reason and why? Um, why was that like that? Um, yeah, so that's that's a diagram that we get given on the course on Passive House quite early on because um, it's, and you know, once you once you thought about it, it makes absolute sense. Uh, you put a coat on your, you know, around your outside, and um, if you have it all around the outside, then your thermal bridging is pretty much non-existent. So you don't have those uh, large uh, correction factors um, of of cold bridging um, coming into the calculation, as it were. So, yeah, it made it made total sense when when they said it and. You're right, we've been doing masonry cavity walls for donkey's years, but um, if you go around an existing building with a thermal, uh, thermal camera, um, as soon as you hit a junction or a you know, wall, to, wall to floor or even just a corner, um, that's where you see all the, all the heat escaping from, from your internal spaces. So definitely a big, big part of Passive House is, is the thermal bridge free design and the simplest way to do that is to wrap wrap it around the structure um, having said that with timber panel systems you've got the two together so it's just a case of making sure that's minimized um, or you might have you might have the panel and then an extra layer around uh, just to just to deal with that so, yeah. <laughs> okay thank you you're welcome. Great. 
Okay, so I don't think we're going to take any more questions. I can't believe the time is already five to eight. So it's flown by. Thank you, guys. Um, that's been amazing. I'm just going to quickly um, share a few last slides um, just on what is coming up next. So next week, we are looking at um, getting it right on site. So that's on Tuesday, the 15th and also off-site and industrialized construction, which is on the Thursday, the 17th. And again, all of the webinars are free to attend, so please do share them with everybody else. Um, and if you can't make the actual day, they will be recorded. So this one will be recorded and available on the Timber Development UK um, YouTube channel. Again, all free to access. Um, and that's all for tonight. So thank you very much for listening. Um, Tabitha, is there, uh, if anyone has questions about the competition, you can, you can ask them um, via, via here or via Tabitha. Um, and yeah, thank you very much.